There'll be no more sobbing when he stops robbing his old straight song. Wake up, wake up, you sleepyhead. Get up, get up, get out of bed. Cheer up, cheer up, the sun is red. Live long, laugh, be happy. What if I've been blue? Now I'm walking through fields of flowers. Rain may glisten, but still I listen for ours and ours. I'm just a kid again, doing what I did again, singing a song. When the red, red robin comes bob, bob, bobbing along. Les was the best grandpa in the world, except for being a son of a bitch. He had, as my father, Les's son-in-law, described it, a little man's ego. A streak of tyranny that was part of a matched set of ignorance and folly. Les lorded it over a lot of people in Kern County, California. His wife, his daughter, and son-in-law and after he became a captain in the Department of Fish and Game, the wardens under his command, everyone had to obey his dictate. When I say jump, you say how high. He wasn't kidding, and everyone did it with a smile. Except for me, when I was a boy, my grandmother loved to repeat the story of how Johnny would bow to Les, a salam, and say, yes, master. She thought that was so funny. Les shares his birth year, 1899, with famous people, Noel Coward, E.B. White, Jimmy Cagney, Humphrey Bogart, Chief Dan George, and a surprising number of other luminaries. In the course of his life, Les came close to fame. He went hunting with cowboy actor Johnny Mac Brown and Tyrone Power, and he handed Clark Gable a citation for being in possession of too many ducks. The Gable case made headlines, and brought short-lived notoriety to Warden Arnold. Not long after Les retired from Fish and Game in 1961, he and his brother Ollie with their wives drove from California to Tennessee to revisit the ancestral homeland they'd left behind over 50 years earlier. Les had been born in Normandy, which was pronounced like that. Melva, Les's wife, told me later that Les had talked all the way there about the big mountains around their farm. They weren't mountains, she said. They were just these little hills. The way she expressed that was similar to how she looked and sounded when she would repeat the promise that Les had made to her when they were young. Stick with me, baby, and you'll wear diamonds. When Les was an old man, he too would repeat that phrase often in a tone that suggested he had an idea of what it meant to be young and foolish. The Arnold farm must have been a poor one, despite or because of the ten children, with Les at the tag end of the line. Les had a couple of stories that he would repeat over the years. At Christmas, each of us children got a new pair of shoes, an orange from California, and a handful of raisins. The expression on his face showed how dear and cherished was this memory. And he liked to tell about riding with his father in the mule-powered wagon, taking a load of corn to the Jack Daniels distillery and returning home with whiskey. Another favorite story was that our family was related to a president of the United States, James K. Polk. The maiden name of Les's grandmother was Pogue. In the past, so went the story, a branch of the Pogues had changed their name to Polk. Les had, in fact, a souvenir photo of the graveyard monument of James K., one day, visiting in Bakersfield, I went to the public library and chanced to cross a set of volumes about the presidents. I opened a book and looked at the entry for James Polk. 
I found nothing at all about any relatives of James K. that had ever been named Pogue. But Pogue and Polk are close enough for simple folk to weave into a good story that adds luster to a dirt-poor family. Les enjoyed telling how the family boarded the train for California. Les had been a young boy. Mary Jane, his mother, had packed food for the long trip, including a large ham. We kept going west, and the ham got smaller and smaller. He always said that with immense satisfaction, as if the ham were linked in inverse proportion to the fortunes to be had in California. The Arnolds landed in Hanford, a destination that had no explanation. Les never talked about relatives waiting to receive them, or why Chester, or Mary Jane, had chosen the San Joaquin Valley over the citrus groves of Southern California, thus missing the opportunity to buy land in your Belinda, for instance, that would have made the Arnolds neighbors of the family of future President Richard Milhouse Nixon. Why did they pass up the green abundance of the Salinas Valley, a place where young Les might have romped with John Steinbeck. Or, for that matter, if Chester had taken his family to the Los Angeles area, perhaps Les might have been a child extra in the first movie to be filmed in Hollywood, D.W. Griffith's 1910 film, In Old California. Chester and Mary Jane divorced in the early 1920s, when divorce carried a high social cost. The plaintiff in the proceedings is lost in time, as are the causes. Perhaps it was inspired by the 1920 divorce of America's Sweetheart, screen star Mary Pickford, or maybe it had something to do with Les's father, a mean man, as my grandmother described him. She never elaborated on that. As a young man, Les was a sport, a dapper chap who owned a motor, a motorcycle. <laughs> He may have sold it by the time he began courting Melva Craighill. Thomas Edward Craighill, Melva's father, had been something short of a success. A ranch in San Luis Obispo didn't pan out. A cattle ranch in Corcoran also failed. He partnered in a furniture business that became successful enough to motivate the partner to swindle T.E., take control of the venture, and wind up wealthy. Late in her life, Melva told of how T.E. had gone hunting for gold in Tonopah and died there. Melva's mother, Viana Malnerva McLaughlin, was born in Santa Cruz. Her father had been a judge. Melva remembered traveling to Santa Cruz, some 200 miles distance, in a horse-drawn wagon, which would have made for a long and memorable beginning of a vacation. During high school, Melva spent a year with the grandparents in that beautiful town. But some cursory research on my part failed to unearth any Judge McLaughlin in Santa Cruz City or County, and T.E.'s death in Tonopah, searching for treasure, may also be something less than fact. What I take as fact includes the story told to me more than once by Les. He was in a pool hall in Hanford, he looked out the window that faced the sidewalk and saw a girl walking by. This was during the Spanish flu epidemic, when most people going out in public wore white gauze masks to cover nose and mouth, which would not prevent infection, but would give a sense of confidence to the young and healthy who were most at risk. The girl on the sidewalk wore such a mask. She became visible at the window just as Les was starting to break a rack for a new game of eight ball. Drawn by forces beyond mortal comprehension, Les's eyes lifted from the white sphere of the cue ball to the expanse of spotless glass, the clear view, the movement of a girl in a midi blouse, and that same unnameable force took his body erect, pulled him to his full height of five foot six inches, and then transformed time, so that this girl with the dark hair stayed in frame for an eon, 
so that all of Les's buddies could turn away from the game and experience the full impact of that gorgeous girl, could hear Les speak as a prophet. That's the girl I'm going to marry.